Hi, I'm Pastor Ralph Douglas West, pastor of the Church Without Walls, and I'm so excited that you've joined us today. Our heart is to usher lost souls to Christ, empower believers to our spiritual maturity, and I'm thrilled to share that heart with you today through the life-transforming power of the Word of God. I also want to invite you to get a daily encouragement by signing in for my free devotional at ralphdouglaswest.org. Now, let's hear today's message. Be encouraged. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. If Paul had a computer in his prison cell, Paul here would be using two words that computer users have learned to rely on. Delete and reboot. <laughs> and that's what I want to talk about this morning. Delete and reboot. Can I read one line to you what Paul says then? But whatever gains to me I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage <laughs> that I may gain Christ. This is the word of God. You may be seated. There's this PBS show, you may have come across it, called the Antique Road Show. <laughs> The plot of the program is simple. People rummage through their deceased aunt's house, grandparents' house, maybe the attic of their parents' house, and they begin scouring for pictures and cards, photographs, books and Bibles, printings and paintings, and then they bring them to the antique roadshow in hopes that they have stumbled upon some hidden treasure. On a recent episode, a man from Eugene, Oregon, brought in this horrible looking piece of jug, only to discover when the evaluators looked at it, they said, this thing is worth $50,000. And he began to say, what, what, what? And while they were saying that the jug, the vase was $50,000, a friend simultaneously looking at the show told another friend who actually constructed the vase in 1970, said that your 1970 middle school art show jug has just sold as a 19th century or 17th century vase and it's going for $50,000. Well, needless to say, here is a man that thought something was trash that turned out to be treasure that turned out to be trash. Well, sometimes people bring in what they think is trash only to find out that it's treasure. That's the hopes of the show. But there are other times there are people that bring in treasure. At least they think it is only to discover that it's trash. The Apostle Paul found that out. And he writes about it in chapter 3 of Philippians, when in verse 1 he makes a command to be joyful, to rejoice. And then he goes into verse 2 and he makes some comparatives, comparatives, comparisons between verse 2 and verse 3 of what genuine and authentic Christianity looks like and that which is external, formal, and false. He says in verse 2 to beware, and he goes down the list, he gives three distinctions. Beware of the dog, circumcisions, beware of the concision. And then he turns around and makes a comparison where he says here are three characteristic distinctions that I want to highlight for you who say or want to know what genuine Christianity really looks like. He says that there is worship on one hand, glory on the other hand, and no confidence in the flesh, finally. Paul says, 
that one of the distinct marks of a believer who is authentically a Christian is that they worship God. That they hold God up in high esteem and they worship God. And then he says, our boast is in Jesus Christ. That word boast means to glory. And then finally he says, no confidence in the flesh. I mean, if there was anybody that had, and that's what he's about to dig into, confidence in the flesh. If the formal, the external, fleshly natural was what God was looking at as an achievement, then Paul says, I'm better than all of you. <laughs> but if God is looking not at the formal, but the internal, not the external, but the internal, not looking at ritual rigor, but right relationship with God. He says, all of us stand in need of a proper relationship that only God through Jesus Christ can give. Look with me now at the word of God. As Paul now begins to make some assessments on his life, he begins in a place where you and I might want to begin, and that is he reviews his life's achievements. That's what I want to encourage you to do, periodically to sit down and review your life achievements. And this will be your assignment this week and for life, is to sit down at the computer of your life, and you may want to keep a finger on the delete button. As you go down the file, and look at what it says about you. Paul is about to make seven statements about himself. Now, Paul doesn't say, I'm going to say seven things. This is one of those you pick up when you read. And remember, Paul is a Jew, and so he would know that the people of his heritage that would read this would pick up, he's making these seven characteristic statements about himself, which is the number for their perfection. So Paul is saying, in the flesh, I was perfect in the flesh. My external rigorous discipline, my fleshly confidence was perfect. And listen how he says it. Just read along at what he says. He begins with this word in verse number five. And four, he says, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then began to count it. Circumcised on the first day. On the eighth day, he says, not on the 13th year like Ishmael, but I was circumcised on the eighth day. I kept the external ritual. My parents practiced the rigidosity of our heritage to the letter. On the eighth day, there I was circumcised. And then it says, but beyond that, I came from the proper proud parenthood. He says, of the house of Israel. You see, he was not a proselyte. He wasn't a convert. The apostle Paul says, I have direct Israelic descent and heritage. I'm a part of the family of God. In fact, if you wanted to give a nickname to Paul, you would say Paul is a religious blue blood. He comes from the exalted, exalted position of what it means to be in relationship to his own heritage. But not just the proper proud parenthood. Look at his excellent role of brotherhood. He says right here that he's of the tribe of Benjamin. That name, remember Benjamin, is one of the favorite sons of Jacob, of the wife that he loved, Rachel. And here he says that the first king came from the tribe, Israel, of Benjamin. And then that very name that comes from that tribe, Benjamin, Saul, the parents of Saul of Tarsus, gives him that same name. He says, I had the right parenthood, I had the right brotherhood, but I also lived in the right neighborhood. Yeah. And his word says that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He grew up in Tarsus, a Greek city, a university town, family, friends, 
schools, surroundings, all of your achievements, God works through that. But that's just four things. Now look at the other three that Paul says. And in the Greek, you know, it begins with these prepositions. And so it gives according to is the way it's written. In NIV, it says it this way. He says, in regard to the law, my goodness, he says, I've achieved elitism. By his own rigorous discipline, Paul was an elite Pharisee. Don't miss this. In the sense that he kept the 613 subdivision, external, visible, tangible laws that everybody else couldn't remember, he kept them. It's hard for me to keep the Ten Commandments. And every one of us have broken all of them. Paul says, I was an elite Pharisee. Wait a minute, he takes it further than that. He says, with zeal, he was persecuting the church. That is, I was so much connected to Judaism when I heard of the Jesus movement and that this Nazarene who was supposed to be posing as the Messiah, I made it my self-appointed deputization to go out and put an end to the church. One more thing he says here though. He says, as far as legalism, faultless. That is... I was as perfect in my external religious rigor as a person could be. Now, he didn't mean that he was perfect in the sense that he had no failures. He meant by rites and rituals and externality that there he was, he was highly, highly, highly successful, rigorous in his discipline. Now, I wish that I could say this morning that this sermon had no bearing on us this morning. In this room, when you have this many people, you have some elite moral snobs who really believe that they're better than the person they're seated next to. I remember once in my church, a young man, he bless his heart, he didn't understand the doctrine of sin at that point. He really didn't. He said to me, I just can't identify with anything that you talk about because, and he went down the list. He says, I don't cuss. I don't drink, because there's only about seven sins in the world. <laughs> and I don't drink, you know. And, and, and went down that. I said, you're talking about activity. Sin is a disposition. <laughs> you were born in that and shaped in iniquity. So when you say, why would I have to read a list like this? It's not to memorize Paul's list. It's to put your list next to it of all of your heredity and your achievements. When you look at all of your credentials and when you look at your name and title and you see where you sit in your position, God says, they may be impressed, but I'm not impressed. That's what Paul was getting to. Here in this word this morning, God brings us and says, review the achievements of your life's father. One of the great 20th century theologians was a man named Carl Barth during the World Wars. Barth served in the military. And one night while he was keeping watch, out by a haystack of all places. Some young soldiers were passing by him. They greeted each other and in exchange, they gave their names and he said, my name is Carl Bart. One of the young men turned around and says, are you ever mistaken for the great theologian, Carl Bart? And he said, no. <laughs> Bart understood what it meant to be Bart in the war. It didn't matter how much theology he knew holding that haystack with a rifle, but he also knew this is not the place to try to promote oneself. 
Many of us know the story, and some of you grew up in the tradition of Methodism, and you remember the story of John Wesley, Oxford student, one of 19 children of Savannah Wesley, who meticulously nurtured her children, who became one of the great theologians and accompanied with his brother John Wesley part of the Oxford Brotherhood who wanted to be a missionary and was so rigorous in his religiosity that he was called Methodist. Goes to Georgia to win some of the Indians and then he says that they'll be saved, but who shall save me? Came back to England so frustrated and not knowing what to do and his faith waning and, and wondering where to place his faith. He goes to Aldersgate's church one night and while someone was just reading the preface to the letter to the Romans, there he said, and you remember his words, better than I, his heart was strangely warmed. And that night, that night he knew his sins had been forgiven and that Christ had been made Lord. Let me tell you something, church. More and more, we are moving so far from Christ that even he sounds like a stranger in his own house. When we come in this room, we come not for me, not for you, not for any entertainment. We come for Christ. And the more you preach about him, you feel almost like you're talking about the wrong thing, even in church. As people have said to me, I've received letters. Pastor, we want you to preach about how to get cash, clothes, and cars. That's so easy to do. Just handle your money right. You can get whatever you want. But you should want something more than cash, clothes, and money. You should want something that shall last through the ages. I'm done with the sermon now. But you can reevaluate your life files in verse number seven. Here this word says, but whatever were gains. Do you have gains in plural in your translation or is it in the singular? In the Greek it is really the plural. But whatever were gains to me. And so the gains that he's speaking of is his heredity and his achievements. Whatever were gains to me. That's what he's speaking of now. I now consider loss. Paul says, let me tell you something. I have achieved everything that I spoke about. But now when I reevaluate my life, all of it, all seven of them, all categorical imperative, all is lost for the sake of Jesus Christ. You have to sit down periodically and you have to evaluate your life's achievements. He says, whatever I have profited is lost now. Paul is sitting down with his finger on the delete button. He deliberately, carefully comes to this conclusion. He says, something greater has captured my imagination. This morning, right now, when the sun has come up, the stars were still out. But when the sun rises, sun just blocks out the other lights. When a great person walks in a room, lesser men fade away. When Christ comes into your heart, everything that you thought was significant is lost. This morning, if you don't agree with that, it's only because Christ is not Lord of your life. I, I want to say that to you. If your achievements, if your heredity, if your wife, if your husband, if your children even, takes that center throne, Christ has not become Lord of your life. And I'm going to tell you something. God is a jealous God. And he will not tolerate anybody, anyone, anything to have his reigning position on the throne of your life. He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. 
I'm done now. Let me say one more thing about this. And that is you might have to reboot the file. That's what they say you have to do. I was reading up on this. You need to know about computers. Everything is a computer now. The car you drive is a riding computer. The phones, they call them smartphones, which implies the user is kind of dumb. <laughs> These computers, though, I mean, your, your televisions, computers, that's all, they're just big computers. And they always have on that these pop-up restarter programs. Uh, some of you may have saw a couple of weeks ago on uh, Lester Holt was interviewing whoever, some guru about how to delete files, how to get rid of files. And people always want to know how to do that, how to get rid of files. I think Microsoft has this thing that if a file is open, you know you can't get rid of it. Then others say, well, you can't never get rid of the files. You know, they're always out in computer space somewhere. And so in this conversation, they said, well, it's, it's a way to get rid of these files. They said, and the way to get rid of the file is get a hammer. <laughs> Yeah, and smash the thing to smithereens. Or get a drill and drill straight through it. And they said, that's how you get rid of the file. Well, Paul says, I don't have a hammer or a drill. He says, nothing in my hand I bring. Only to God's cross do I cling. And he knew that the way that you delete the file of your life, rebooted for a new life, is that when Jesus Christ becomes the one that gives you a new set of files. Can I show it to you? I'm done now. He said, what is more? I love this. I consider everything. Now stop, because I know what church I'm preaching to, and I know you already saw it. I, I know you see it now, don't you? You say, oh, in the preceding verse, he says, whatever gains, the Greek word there speaks to just these things previously mentioned. But now in verse number eight, he said, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Everything loss, not just my categories, not just my heredity and my personal achievements, but everything. Where did Paul get that from? Where did that come from? I'm glad you asked. You know where it come from. Acts chapter nine, walking on the Damascus road on the outskirts of the city to go in and to destroy God's church. God arrests him and knocks him down to his feet, off of his feet, down on his face. And at that very moment, what he discovers is God has deleted the old files, rebooted his life and given him a new category. These people who stand and clap are not standing and clapping out of some emotional response. They stand up and clap and we wave in agreement that God too have knocked us down and deleted our files and have rebooted our lives. Re delete the files. Some of you live with guilt and shame. Some of you live with past failures and, and they haunt you all the time because you are still trying to delete the file only to discover you can't delete it by drugs, you can't delete it by promiscuity, you can't delete it by achievement. You got to have somebody who can, can delete and then reboot your life and start it all over again. Again, we rejoice, not because we're perfect and walk on water, but because we have a Savior who has rebooted our lives, given us a new file. I think Paul was saying this way, that if you're in Christ, all things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. 
for the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ, to know him. Did you pay attention to the hymn this morning? To know him. Did you pay attention to the song that they sang? The men, to know him this morning. Life can be hectic and too often our spiritual lives suffer because of it. Sometimes it can seem impossible to find quiet time to pray and to reflect on God's word. That's why I'm excited to offer my 30-day devotional guide, an upload for a new outlook, as a thanks for your gift to encourage others with the gospel. So call now or go online to make a donation and request your copy. I pray it encourages you and helps you dive deeper into God's word, even in life's busiest seasons. Be encouraged. I'm Pastor Ralph Douglas West. I want to personally invite you to attend one of the most amazing church growth and development conferences in the country. The IC3 Issachar Church Growth and Development Conference. This year's theme is Who's Shaping Who? Church, Culture, and Community. Our mission is to equip leaders to grow their churches, connect with communities, and transform an unchurched culture. April 25th through the 27th, you and your church leaders will experience three days of dynamic preaching, teaching, and storytelling, along with practical ideas and solutions on how to reach your community and grow your church. We have assembled what I believe is the best teaching team of pastors and leaders from across the country to come and share with you. Over 50 very practical breakout sessions, like every Sunday is a Super Bowl Sunday, developing a 21st century staff, taking the stew out of stewardship, preparing green pastures for pastors, leading through conflict, and many, many, many more. So sign up today, bring your anti-staff and ministry leaders for a time of learning, networking, and inspiration. For conference details and registration, go to ic3churchconference.com. Again, that's ic3churchconference.com. Be encouraged.